Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 127, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. And me, Ravi Abbott. Now, before we get into this week's show, I do have to apologise if I sound all bunged up and husky today. I think this might be the first year I actually die from hay fever. Oh, God, yeah, the summer's coming and, you know, Dan, he gets colds, but he also gets hay fever, so... Oh. <laughs> A double to, whammy, isn't it? May have something to do with the fact we're recording this on Tuesday night and had about five pints in the pub while watching the England game last night. But, you know, we'll, we'll skirt over that bit. Uh, did you drop <laughs> any when we scored? You know, I actually watched the World Cup. We've got a hotel over the road from That's us. That's weird for you because you don't like football, do you? I don't normally watch football at all, but when England are playing in the World Cup, I kind of feel like, all right, you know, it, it's an excuse to get caught up in the atmosphere. Yeah. And I live like near a hotel and it's full of businessmen normally. When and then, it was the most subdued England match I've ever <laughs> seen. When they scored, like, uh, it's like one guy in the corner went, yay! <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. But if you are watching the World Cup and getting caught up in it, then enjoy. If you are suffering from hay fever, good excuse to stay indoors and play a load of video games, though, isn't it? Totally. And I've not been staying indoors. No, I've been busy. I've been in London for RetroCon, which was an amazing event, you know. What was this then? This happened last weekend? Yeah, it was run by uh, Greenford Computer Club. And the Commodore lads, and they had David Pleasance there, they had Trevor Dickinson, and loads of cool machines. It was quite nice. And then in the evening, we went to Slope's beer launch, which was quite nice as well. So this weird him on the show last week on our uh, YouTuber panel, Danny Libertson from Slope's Game Room. He launched his own beer. Now, if you want to find out how and why he's done this, check out last week's show. Did you try any of the beer? Oh, yeah, it's really nice, okay. actually. Pretty good. And Kim Justice knocked my pint over as soon as I got in there. <laughs> um, we also, I'm going to Nova Demo Party yeah. as well this weekend, which is going to be really cool. We're going to be sitting there coding in a town hall in Cornwall. That sounds like loads of fun. So is it going to be like a proper old school demo party style where you like lock yourself in there all weekend and then... Yeah. Wow, I, yeah, I think I think a few people will be bringing their machines. There's people coming from Germany and yeah. stuff like that. Um, I'm not going to bring my Amiga because I can't carry such a big beast on the train yeah. you know so i'm getting uh emulated piece of software which is amiga forever and kindly mike batalana from Calanto has given free copies to everybody going to nova to yeah. so see ravi if you go in there yeah. have some of his briefcase <laughs> you could bring your commodore 64 oh yeah i could actually yeah, yeah. Let's do that because that needs some love ravi have you turned it on yet no <laughs> How long have you had that now? About six months? Ages. I'm, I, yeah. Go on, Ravi, Ravi needs to get up to date on that Commodore 64 scene. Uh, and this weekend, though, I'm actually going to an event. Um, it's a bit short notice, but it's happening tomorrow at the time this show comes out on Saturday. Uh, just check the date on my calendar quickly. That'll be the uh, 23rd of June. And I'm going to be at the uh, Retro Computer Museum in Leicester. So they're celebrating their 10th birthday this oh, weekend. Oh, that's really cool. Amazing place, the Retro Computer Museum in Leicester. Like, you could just have so much fun in there, just get trapped in there. Well, we went in October, we hosted an event there, didn't we, just before Christmas? Yeah. And November, I think it was, actually. And they were building, like, a new part of the museum that we kind of got a bit of a tour of. So I'll be interested to see. I'm not sure whether that bit's open yet or whether it's, like, nearly completed. I but think I'll be quite it is. Yeah. Is it? Cool. Yeah. That looks like a really big space. We were just, like, nerding out over all the machines they had in there <laughs> and their uh, little private collection at the back. So if you have got, um, you know, a bit of time over the weekend, you're anywhere near Leicester, uh, come along tomorrow. I think David Pleasance is going to be there as well. Our buddy's coming up. So, uh, yeah. Should be a good weekend, wherever you're going to be. Right now, before we get into um, this week's news stories, we've got uh, an amazing guest on this week's show as well, who's actually someone that we met at an event last year. We were hanging out with him at the uh, the after party at Play Expo in Blackpool, weren't we? Yeah, and he's all over the place at the moment. It's Quang from Asobi Tech, and they're doing a, cas- uh, a game called Mao Mao Cas at the moment, and this is so cool. Like, the controller is your hand. Yeah. And it's kind of like Space Harrier, but you feel like you've got a, a power glove or something. But it looks like a Nyan cat, like, flying through the sky. And it's pretty tough, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, we, we were playing it probably for about an hour. You, me and Joe and Alex as well, yeah. our mate. Um, we kind of got a bit of a play on an early version of it about six months ago. Uh, but again, very addictive. I think I probably made it for about a minute and a half, I think was my record. Well, he's, a, yeah. he's an ex-Game Boy coder, and he's also... Uh, console collector so you know he's got 250 game consoles as well really into this stuff but uh really into indie development and using kind of different kinds of inputs and uh old school graphics and chiptune music it's just 
fantastic title. Yeah, we're going to proper geek out on this one, oh, aren't yeah. we? So uh, make sure you hang around for that. Really good. Quan is going to be our guest in around 20 minutes from now on the Retro Owl podcast. Now, before we get into this week's news stories, um, let's just give a big up to the people who allow us to keep doing this show week in, week out, and get into all these amazing events. And that is our loyal supporters who make donations into the running of the Retro Hour podcast. And, you know, we always say every week, it's a tip jar. Think of it that way. Completely optional. If you want to put a couple of quid, a couple of dollars, a couple of euros in, that's massively appreciated. If not, completely fine. Just enjoy the show every week. But if you'd like to support us, all you have to do is head onto our website. You'll find a little PayPal button on there. And we have cryptocurrency too, if that's your thing, at theretrohour.com. And for doing that you'll get a shout in the Retro Hour Hall of Fame. Just like Pete Black, Carl Kuras, Eric Nelson, and John Monterano. And you can do the same. Leave a donation on the website, theretrohour.com. And we've been having a few little issues with the website, <laughs> and this is because our security certificates have expired. So I'm going to be renewing them, and that's why donations kind of help us out. So if you are getting any security errors and messages on the website, don't worry. We haven't got anything bad on there that's going to harm you but you shouldn't be getting the errors by this weekend probably yeah hopefully you've sorted it and yeah. obviously it doesn't affect donations that's all secure paypal yeah, yeah no, no one's date it's been leaked don't <laughs> worry gdpr gdpr <laughs> right then let's get into this week's stories because this first story um blew my mind now i think i've spoken on the show before about um a friend of mine I used to have when i was a kid dougie who had a Sega Master System. Now, he had the, the Master System 2, you know, the one with Alex Kidd and Miracle World built in? Oh, yeah. And that was the only game that he had, so we used to play that all the time. But I think the fact that the Master System was a lot bigger in the rest of the world, particularly over here in the UK, than it was in America, means that you don't actually hear all that much about it, usually. And it, I think it is a very underrated system. And a lot of people don't realise exactly what it's capable of. Because the Master System actually has a few surprises up its sleeve, it turns out in terms of audio quality. Tell us about this new demo that's come out then. Yeah, so um, this was reported on Indie Retro News and they've kind of got it a little bit wrong. Um, they're talking about how he was using a new Commodore 64 kind of algorithm to make this. On, and, on the Master System? Yeah, okay. and it, it, he tried that, but it didn't sound very good. This is actually an audio library that was used in Alex Kidd Miracle World 2. Right. So okay. there was a tiny little sample at the end of... Alex Kid Miracle World 2. And also the Glee Glee demos, which are that bad Apple thing which we've talked about, oh, yeah, which yeah. is a full motion video on kind of old school systems. Now, what he's done is he's basically increased the sample rate so that 90% of the resources are used on the master system. So... It sounds a lot higher quality, but you're not going to be able to play a game with it, you know? So this is it. And I think we all recognise the song. Now, this is running on a Sega Master System. 8-bit machine. Listen to that quality. It's 4-bit yeah. uh, PCM sound and at 10.3 kilohertz, which is absolutely amazing. But now, he's also managed to do a kind of a palette in the background, 20 eight unique colours. Or flicker it away. All running at 12.5 frames per second. <laughs> it does sound like a, a low bitrate MP3. Yeah, it's just awesome that you can yeah. hear that on the Master System. Uh, absolutely amazing. And the uh, the screen reminds me a bit of like, you know, when the Commodore 64 is loading a game and you get that kind of yeah. decompressing thing. So he uh, he was saying, you know, he has a copy of Smart My Bitch Up that he wanted to <laughs> right. put out, but um, he's worried about copyright on YouTube. Yeah, but I'd, lo right, I'd love right. to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> that is awesome, though. And, and that actually goes on for a minute 20. So like he said, you know, to pack all that into the resources of a master system, I think. Well, well, the, the problem is the cart size as well, because he was saying, you know, there was a limit on the cart size, but with the Ever EverDrive, you can actually push it uh, quite far. Yeah. So I think it was four megabytes in total, though, the whole file. <laughs> that is nuts, though, isn't it? And I love that because, again, it's you wouldn't expect the, the master system to be able to do that. No. And whenever people push machines be beyond their conceived limits, I always think it's really exciting. So he's in a couple of these, hasn't he, the videos? I'll put those in yeah, the show Yeah, yeah, there's a Daft Punk one as well, which yeah. is pretty cool. So we'll put all those in our show notes at theretrohour.com if you want to check them out. Now, this has been a bit divisive. I've seen lots of people arguing on both sides of this one. Now, um, this is an article on Kotaku, a massive collection of rare, previously unreleased or obscure Japanese games has leaked online without the owner's permission. Oh, okay. Now, have you heard about this? Uh, no, I haven't, actually. This this seems really interesting, because I love these, like, 
unknown games that get leaked. Well, this is 70 lost Japanese video games, including um, the third game in what was quite an obscure point-and-click horror uh, trilogy. It was meant to be three games um, called the Horror Tour Trilogy. Now, the first one came out in Japan, and it got an actual um, Western port on the PC as well uh, with a different name. It was called Zedas, Servant of Shiel. Um, the sequel, Horror Tour 2, never came out outside of Japan. And the third game, a lot of people didn't think it actually existed, but a YouTuber um, actually did a video of a walkthrough of it, so that's out there. Now, the details on this are a little bit sketchy, but what it turns out is, apparently in Japan, the culture is a little bit different from reading this article on Kotaku. Uh, apparently, there's like a scene out there of retro gaming collectors who... They have it, we'd probably think of it as a hoarder mentality. Yeah. So they like getting hold of these rare exclusive games, very obscure ones, sharing it with their close friends, but not actually putting it out there for everybody and to being play. the only group in the world to have that, yeah. Exactly. Kind of the prestige of doing it, I guess, and being that guy that has it. Um, but it turns out he actually shared, the owner of this collection of ROMs, shared it with someone else. And this guy uploaded it, you know, as a torrent, so everyone could download oh, it. Oh, God. So, there you go. Yeah, I mean, and, uh, wasn't it marked "Do not upload"? <laughs> yeah, that was like, right at the top in a text file. So uh, blatantly, the guy that owned it didn't want people to share it. And these games are kind of—I'm looking at them. They're like dungeon crawlers, but with like that CGI FMV from you know the early kind of PC CD-ROM style, or or one of those FMV consoles. Well, there's loads of them. Yeah, the 67 gigabytes worth. Wow, that linked to your 70 games. So there's a lot of them, and again, a lot of games that people either thought were like vaporware and didn't exist or, you know, ones that are really, really rare and maybe only sold a few. Well, I'm copies. glad they've been leaked. I'm sorry, but I think holding on to them, it's a bit unfair, isn't it? You know? I agree. And I was reading this and again, it's like, you know, they were trying to explain that it is a different culture there. It's not quite the same as here. And now they're kind of worried that maybe other collectors who have the games won't share them with anyone and just keep it to themselves now. So it might affect getting games in the future. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm with you. I don't see the the point in having this rare, exclusive game that no one else in the world's got and you've been the only guy to have it. Yeah, yeah, you should get it out for everyone because then also, you know, other people might mod it or they might help improve the game. More players, the better it is. You know? Well, you know, they call themselves archivists and I think if you're archiving something, surely the, the goal is to preserve it for you future generations. You archive something to put it in a library or a museum or <laughs> to present it. Yeah, but you know? if you're the only guy that's got it, it dies with you, doesn't it? It's like... I call it a miser. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that well, would be mine. hoarder seems to be what most yeah. people are saying in the comments here. Uh, I can kind of see both sides of the argument. I mean, some people are saying maybe it wasn't ready to release yet, and this guy would have done it. He just wanted to polish him up a little bit, and he didn't want it quite out there yet. Which you know, you can see that. But um, I think it's more important that these games are out there for people to share. I mean, you know, if you've got the original copy, yeah. that's still going to be valuable. Having a ROM of it on an emulator is not going to take away the value of the original copy. No, totally not. And, you know, there's going to be collectors that are going to want that. And I also love, you know, the video games that just get leaked by accident. You know, people find them in a car boot sale and stuff, and there's loads of those as well. Well, I'm working on an Amiga game that never got released at the moment with a couple of friends. You know, we're at the stage where we're getting it working, and hopefully one day we can get it out there. So I, I kind of relate to this. Yeah. But again, I've got this game, and I want to spread it if possible. I don't want to keep it to myself and be the only guy in the world with it. So, yeah, I mean, I think if you've got something, get it out there, let people yeah, enjoy it. That's exactly. why these games were made in the first place. Now, speaking of games that we enjoyed, you found a Battletoads. Oh, yes, I have, and uh, as as Mark Knight <laughs> kindly calls it, Battle Turds. <laughs> <laughs> You're not a fan? <laughs> well, I wasn't a fan of the ports to some systems. Yeah. I, I, it's a classic game, though, Battle Toads, if you've got good controllers with it, not one fire button. Well, the NES one seems to be the, the most popular version, doesn't it? The yeah. one that came out of the Nintendo Entertainment System back in 1991 uh, by Rare. Uh, and obviously, Microsoft have owned Rare for a number of years now. And they did release it as part of, part of the, um, the Rare Replay package that came out on the Xbox yeah. One. But apparently, they're going to be doing a full updated version in 4K graphics of Battletoads for the Xbox One. Ah, oh, cool. And the thing that I like about this, they've said hand-drawn yeah. 2.5D which is like what we really love. Because the whole thing about Battletoads was it was that cartoonish look, wasn't it? And it, yeah. and it did seem hand-drawn. Yeah, it's not like... I think it would have ruined it if they did like a, a rendered kind of 3D kind of... Really you know, slick like. CGI thing, yeah. But if it looks like a cartoon, I think that'll be awesome. I mean, I'm kind of picturing it like maybe something like Cuphead, you know, those yeah. kind of draw, hand-drawn graphics. I think it'll be good, but um, they're not actually confirming whether it's going to kind of be an HD upgrade of the original game or maybe a new game in the Battletoads universe. 
mm. um, which could be a possibility. But uh, you know, a lot of people do think the original game's far too hard. Uh, well, that's cool that they're redoing this. Do you think they'll start to redo other older kind of stuff? You know. Well, again, I mean, we've talked about it on the show with Sega doing it as well. I think it's cool that these companies are kind of looking at their back catalogue now and seeing what can we upgrade and bring back for the fans. You know, yeah. that'd be cool. I was playing the other day, um, Splatterhouse, and I thought that'd be oh, awesome. Splatterhouse was massive, wasn't it? Well, I was at my parents' house. I'm a Nintendo Switch there. And I was playing it. My dad's like, what's that noise? And I showed him, you know, when you've got a club and you're splatting them up against the wall. <laughs> he goes, all right, okay, do kids still play stuff like that? Or is it worse now? I said, no, I, no it's a lot more gory now, Dad. He goes, oof. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he approved. Now, if you remember that era of video games, maybe you didn't have a Mega Drive and play Splatterhouse. Maybe you're more a Super Nintendo fanboy. I know mates of mine used to have Super Nintendos back in the day. Only, only the posh friends of mine had those. <laughs> yeah, one of my friends at school, Martin, he had one. He had the uh, you know the, the gun as well. The oh, Super Scope. Super Scope. That's yeah. the thing. Yeah, great bit of hardware. The Super Nintendo. I've, I've I bought one in recent years. Big fan of it. But I, you know, these days you often see stuff like if you've got an EverDrive on a Mega Drive, you can play Master System games. Yeah. Do a bit of emulation. You know, and you, see... could, you could do Game Boy games on the um, uh, Super Nintendo as yeah. well, couldn't you? Yeah, the adapter, so, yeah. same on the GameCube as well with advanced games. You don't normally see it the other way around, though, do you? Like a never em- an ever. NES emulating a SNES. Yeah, no, never. And this this story absolutely blew my mind when I saw it. <laughs> Reverse emulation. Yeah, that's a cool name. So this is a guy who's essentially managed to get Super Nintendo games running on an unmodified. NES. So we're talking 16-bit games. There's a video on YouTube here, and the whole video is about 25 minutes long. And he shows the process of doing it. His name is Tom Murphy, the guy that's uploaded this video. Now, you might be thinking, how on earth is, is it possible? He shows um, Super Mario World off the um, Super Nintendo running on the NES. Now, again, when I saw that, I was like, okay, I've got to watch this and get my head around it. Essentially, he uses the hardware of a Raspberry Pi inside a Nintendo cartridge. <laughs> so it's kind of doing some... I'm not going to go into all the technical details because it, it's a bit beyond my, uh, my pay grade. Uh, but looking at this, I mean, he's essentially got the Raspberry Pi to decode the information that's been sent from the ROMs of the SNES game, convert it into information that the NES can understand. But through the cartridge port. Yeah. That is insane. And the thing is, you can see these games running, and there's a few little graphical glitches here and there. It, it can't, you know what it, it looks like? It flickers a lot. It looks like early 360 YouTube video or 240. <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> kind of like that. Well, you look at it, I mean, he hasn't managed to get sound working on it, but, you know, the scrolling is there. Um, and you can play the game. I mean, obviously, you've got a difference in the controllers. Yeah. So the only jump move you can do is kind of the spin jump um, because of the, you know, there's less buttons on a NES controller. Uh, but the fact that he's managed to do this at all, I think, is absolutely insane. Got Super Mario World running on a NES, and the NES has got less colors. So essentially, what this process does, the Raspberry Pi kind of downgrades the colour palette and kind of picks near colours that the NES can oh, do. Oh, wow. So it doesn't look bad, actually. That's incredibly smart. <laughs> yeah. Such a cool little hack, isn't it? But what they're saying is, I mean, essentially, if you're looking at this, it's kind of a pass-through, but some people in the comments here have kind of likened it to what the 32X did on the Mega Drive. Mm, yeah. You're putting a game through the Mega Drive's hardware display and then outputting it at the other end. So essentially, yeah, you're putting the output of the Raspberry Pi through the NES. It's mad that you can kind of get these modern systems and then, uh, you know, Raspberry Pis are amazing for yeah. boosting your, your old school system. I've seen so many little things. Even they're talking about the Spectrum Next. They're talking about having a, a Raspberry Pi element in there, you know. <laughs> Just when you thought the Raspberry Pi couldn't amaze you anymore. But uh, <laughs> yeah, if you're doing to check this out, I'll put a link in the show notes at the retrohour.com. Now, do you still buy physical games? Yeah, I've started to buy a lot more physical games and I, I was a Steam master for ages but then literally I find myself going through my list of ones on Steam and I'm just like, God, you know, I, I want I want cases and I want manuals and stuff like that. Can you still get physical PC games? Um, some, mainly the limited edition stuff. So like, you know, the stuff that you get that comes with a, a, a figure and a map and yeah. a T-shirt and a pair of pants, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems that you're not alone. Uh, according to a new bit of research, 66% of console players still prefer physical games over digital. You're talking just over half then, I guess, aren't you? I mean, it was a bit more than half. Um, well, I, I, I think it's probably bad experiences. So, like, how many times have you rebought the same game for different systems? Yeah, well, yeah, too many. 
you know, and I've also had stuff like, oh God, the old Xbox Live membership, that went on one of my accounts, I had to get another, I know people that have had hundreds of games and they've been locked out of some accounts and lost a lot of the titles, you know. That is a scary bit, I think, about having your entire game library be on some server and reliant on one account and a password. And, you know, I've heard stories before of people getting banned from, like, Xbox Live and PSN through no fault of their own, through a glitch, or their account gets compromised. And then if you'd bought... I mean, God, when did when did they start selling digital games on Xbox? Probably about 10 years ago, yeah. maybe even longer. But imagine you had, like, a decade's worth of games worth thousands of pounds, and then you lost it all. Oh, God, scary yeah. stuff, you know. I mean, that's kind of... I guess it'd be like losing your physical games in a house fire, wouldn't it? It's kind of a comparison, <laughs> yeah. But I can see why. I mean, weirdly, I do buy most of my Nintendo Switch games on physical. But I was away on holiday a couple of weeks ago, and I've got a little like little plastic box that you can put little cartridges in there. They're not very big on the Switch, are they? So I do take it away, but often I'm like, you know, I was on the plane trying to play games. I'm trying to get them out of the little box there. I thought it'd be so much easier for all on the actual system. So the Switch is really a system where it does make sense, I think, to have them all on the machine. Yeah, and I, I think it's it's a bit easier to consume them when you can see them. You know, yeah. it's like when you've got all these TV channels and you're just surfing through and you've got hundreds of choices. When we had four channels, <laughs> it's like a lot easier. And seeing those things up there, oh yeah, just that one. And also the box art and all that, you know, you really appreciate it. I think there's that, you mean, it's kind of like showing off your hobby a bit, isn't it? When you come around and your friends are there and you've got a nice big shelf with all your games displayed, you feel mm. proud of it. I guess you can kind of compare it to... Somebody buys vinyl. Or yeah, well, vinyl, vinyl coming back because of the uh, kind of physicality of it. And, you know, you're right as well, because even they had it in game, they had these redeem code cards that had replaced games. And it's just like, ah! <laughs> yeah, well, I've been in game and looking at the Nintendo Switch games in there. And you're right, stuff in there that I've never seen in the shops and they're in a box. And I think it was Legend of Zelda I was trying to buy, actually, which obviously you can buy in physical. But I went to the girl in the shop and I was like, oh, you never got any more copies of this. She goes, we can give you a digital download code. And it was the same price as buying it from the e-store anyway. Yeah. So I said to her, well, can I have the box? And she goes, well, oh, no, we can't give you the box. Well, like, anybody who's buying games on Steam or Origin as well, would you please use like G4 uh, Play or one of these one of these key sites because you can get your games so much cheaper than they are on Steam. What's the one that you use? I think it's G4A. Yeah, okay. Yeah, because you've sent that to me before. And yeah, you kind of do get big discounts on those, don't you? Yeah, it's crazy. And they always deliver the keys as well. So... um like, if you have a problem with not receiving your key, you can contact them, but a lot of the time they're like a quarter of the price. <laughs> yeah, it's all good. For, you know. That's one thing about PC gaming. It's a lot cheaper than console gaming, isn't it, once you've actually got the hardware. Yeah. But, I mean, you know, thinking about physical console games as well, I mean, I was gaming with my brother on Friday night on Xbox Live, and he put, like, his his game disc in. It had a little scratch on it, and it wasn't working properly. And he looked at it, and there's, like, a tiny amount of data on there. All it really is, you put a game in an Xbox One, it's a key to download it off the server. <laughs> so there's not really anything on the disc anyway. No. So right. making owning a physical game a bit pointless, really, apart from keeping the brick and mortar stores alive. Totally. That's it. They haven't got anything to put in there. And yeah. I've noticed that at the moment. A lot of, like, pants and stuff start, <laughs> start appearing. There's all these, what is it, PlayStation hoodies? Now oh, they're everywhere, aren't like they? That, yeah. yeah. Half of game, I think, is, like, merchandise yeah. these days. But I, I think their days are numbered. I can't imagine physical game shops being around in 20 years. No, I can imagine them all going and then all coming back, like like the independent vinyl shops yeah. and stuff. You know, I think I think there'll be a resurgence for it in the future. Well, I think the retro shops will probably be around longer. Yeah, yeah, um, definitely. Yeah, I mean, even you look at game now. I've got a retro section. Well, well it'll be like an antique shop, won't it? You'll yeah. have Lovejoy, and, <laughs> and you'll go in and it'll be like, oh, <laughs> by Lovejoy and VHS, yeah, and the copy be, Golden Axe on a, Mega Drive. <laughs> do you want a laser disc player? Yeah. <laughs> I'd, I'd love a shop like that. We can get laser discs. Antiques Roadshow. They'll all be sitting there looking at laser discs. <laughs> well, I, I used to have a, a game shop I used to go to when I was a kid, and they had like a, a movie bit in the back. And then I had a big proper popcorn maker in there, oh, like nice. you get in the cinema. And there was laser discs in there. And I remember going through them and thinking, oh, I'd love to be able to afford one of these. Still haven't got a laser disc play. I've mentioned it on the show before. And thank you to everyone. Yeah, I've had a few people tweet me and get in touch, tell me which models to buy and all that. I think when we move and I get like, hopefully this summer we get a, a bigger house. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll make the plunge and finally get into laser disc collecting. Well, I got, I got a tweet from Aaron White who was telling me he was recording his laser, 
laser disc soundtracks in mini disc. I was like, dude, that's so cool. <laughs> yeah, you don't get many people doing that anymore. So props, Aaron. Right then, well, thank you for checking out the news section this week. Of course, every story that we've talked about, uh, you can check it out. We put all the links in the show notes at theretrohour.com. Saves you Googling around and finding stuff. We do it all for you. And also, if you'd uh, like to support the show in another way, if you listen on any podcast clients, keep your ratings coming in, keep your reviews, keep your Facebook reviews coming in as well. We've had a few of those actually on our Facebook page. Yeah, they were Pretty awesome. Nice. Thank you. About 35 on there now. Yeah. So obviously it all helps get the show in front of new people. So massively appreciated. And now we're going to nerd out. This is going to be so interesting. We're the, probably one of the biggest gaming collectors we've ever met. Such a cool guy. Quang from Asobi Tech is this week's special guest. You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast, and it is time for the main event, the bit that we've been looking forward to. Time to welcome on our guest this week. Welcome to the show, Quang Nguyen. Thank you for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having us. Now, we are going to get into um, your recent developments, because we actually met, didn't we, at um, Play Expo in Blackpool back in February, when you're showing off this uh, really cool new game, Mau Mau Castle. You've been getting a lot of attention for that recently, haven't you? Yeah, uh, we've been showing it as much as we can at many events as possible. Um... Just gotta get the eyes of the game, I guess. Well, let's kind of wind back to the start then. I mean, what was it originally that got you into computers and gaming then? Where did your journey start with it all? Oh, I guess it uh, started with a Specky. Um, my dad got us a Specky Plus 2, and we dove in and played a few games. And then after a while, I learned to code basic with it and got enamored with that um, and went to the libraries, got as many books as I could, got the magazines out, got typing listings, and kind of took it from there. So, what specy model was it? Was it a basic specy, or was it? A, yeah, a... yeah, it was the plus two. Um, um, a few of my friends had had the rubber keyed specy, um, but by the time I joined, um, the plus two was out with a built-in tape deck yeah. and joystick ports. What kind of games were you creating then, or, or you know, with these uh, writings from the books? What what kind of stuff were you making? Uh, stuff on Spectrum Basic was really simple stuff. Um, so my first game, I coded was a simple three-lane racing game like those old lcd games where you just choose one of the three lanes and you dodge traffic as it came towards you so really simple stuff and did you uh did you show that to your mates and stuff what did they think uh yeah so i would have been oh about 10 years old when i made that hmm. um so my friends were pretty impressed well then you went on to the um 16-bit machines now i don't start a war here ravi's a big amiga fanboy i know uh <laughs> i know you, you're more atari st what do you quang yeah, so I was an ST kid when I was growing up. I managed to convince my father that getting the Atari ST was a good move because it had a word processor, it had a database, and it had a printer, and I, I could do my schoolwork on it. And did you do a lot of schoolwork on it? Actually, yeah. We used the word processor quite a lot, actually. Um, my handwriting is now atrocious because <laughs> I started typing from a young age. You know, you make a funny point there because I was the same when I was at school. I think by the time I did all my homework on my computer, I remember, like, I'd pick up a pen and forget how it worked. Like, what? how do you hold this again? <laughs> <laughs> exactly that, yeah. Funny how you rely on it. So you used um, STOS as well, the, the coding language. That was basic, wasn't it? I mean, what, what, did you, what did you think of STOS, and did it make it a lot easier? Yeah, so obviously going from Specky Basic um, over to the uh, Atari ST, uh, I didn't know what, how to code an Atari ST, because it didn't come with any programming languages off the bat. But we went to, I think it was Raven Games back in the days, and we saw Stoss the Games create a sitting on the shelf, and it just blew us away. We, we could make sprites, music, backgrounds, graphics. It was just another level. And how, how was it moving from the 8-bit to the kind of 16-bit? Uh, it wasn't too difficult, to be honest. Um, Stoss made it really, really easy. It, it, it had the same basic commands. It had the same uh, line numbers. Uh, once you learnt the new commands, uh, it, the jump wasn't huge in difficulty, but uh, in scope, it was incredible. Just to be able to actually make games from before on Spectrum, it was just simple character ASCII type games, but now I had sprites and I had music. So what kind of games were you making on Stoss then? Do you remember any of the titles that you made on it? Uh, I made a game called Balloon Crazy, I believe. It was um, sort of like a, a bomb jack type game where you were a hot air balloon and you had to collect canisters of, of gas uh, around a maze and we made a, a three match puzzler before three match puzzles were even a thing um, based off I guess uh, uh, my love for Tetris and things like Puzzle Bobble uh, you had to match uh, we, it was called smileys we had to match similar coloured smiley faces together and did you put these out in public domain then or anything or did you just just you and your friends unfortunately not quite yeah I was I think by then coming up to 14 years old so I had no idea how to distribute games I, I was just 
happy to be making games, but um, yeah, it was just shown amongst my friends. Did you read stuff like ST Format and that back in the day then? Oh, yeah, huge ST Format yeah. uh, fan. Uh, ST Format and ST User were the two magazines back then. When you're young, you don't have that much pocket money anyway to spend, so you'd get as many demos and as uh, much free stuff you, as you could get, and uh, magazines were great for that. Uh, were you, like, ripping sound effects off stuff and kind of music off other stuff and chucking <laughs> it into your games? Uh, so, luckily, um, I've always worked with my brother. Um, my brother dabbled in graphics uh, and music. Uh, we managed to get hold of a sampling cart, Tridge, uh, that let us uh, pipe in our own sounds and sample those for the games. Um, and my brother would write modern music for the games we used. That's one advantage of having a 16-bit machine over the 8 bits. You couldn't have done that in the Spectrum, could you? Exactly, yeah. The Spectrum, to create assets for the Spectrum, it was a lot more difficult. To do anything on the Spectrum was a lot more difficult. I, my hat's off to the pioneers and the guys that came before us making games on those systems. So at what point did you leave the Atari ST behind then and move on to the PC? Um, once we, I got to college, so I did my A-levels, uh, I was introduced to uh, the world of PCs. And uh, with that, came uh, Turbo Pascal um, and they taught us Turbo Pascal in college to program and that just opened up and again another new world. Um, was that with CPM or was it with Windows 3.1? Uh, it was Windows 3.1 so Turbo Pascal was a Borlands product uh, it ran in DOS and uh, it had a graphics mode obviously at school they weren't teaching us to make great games they were actually just teaching us um, simple programming techniques uh, to create databases and lists and stuff but me being uh, enamoured with games, I found about the graphics modes and started making games with it. So I did the same at college, actually. We did Pascal in my, yeah. uh, my IT course I did. It, it all seemed to be the language they preferred to teach, didn't it, Pascal? Yeah, Turbo Pascal at the time, I believe, was a very simple uh, step up from basic. It wasn't quite C, but it, it gave you the structure of, of a uh, functional programming language. And uh, stuff like the floating point must have kind of helped get uh, you know your titles to be much more complex. Yeah, going from <laughs> going from an uh, 8-bit CPU and 16-bit CPU with no floating point processor, uh, then getting these PCs like just you just throw decimal points at it and it wouldn't have a problem. Uh, much nicer. We start I started dabbling in simple 3D um, when that came around. What were you using for 3D then? Oh, it was just simple routines. I remember grabbing a book. Uh, what was the book called? Oh, I, I forget now what the name of the book was, but it was a it had some simple wireframe 3D. Uh, matrices and programming techniques which I implemented in Pascal and we got some I made some simple uh, animations using that uh, it wasn't anything fancy but it was uh, a step up from 2D sprites I guess so you got into coding for handhelds how did you do that and, and why so I think I must have been about again about 14 or so uh, when the Game Boy came out first and I, I, I begged and pleaded with my dad when, when he had a trip to America to bring me back a Game Boy uh, so that's before we got back in the UK. So I got one of the first Game Boys in the UK, I guess. Uh, and I fell in love with it. And uh, I've always been a fan of handheld devices in general. A few years later on, um, someone wrote the GBDK, which is a Game Boy development kit, which is uh, written in C uh, and assembly. And it allowed you to write Game Boy code uh, on your PC. And from there, it just grew very, very quickly. People really forget how insanely popular the Game Boy was when it first came out. There was there was nothing that could match it, was there? Indeed, yeah. For a handled device, uh, it, it just... You know, you, comparing it to the old Tiger and Grandstand LCD games, um, the, the simplicity of those compared to how amazing a Game Boy was, it's just worlds apart. I know, obviously, a couple of years later, stuff like the, the Game Gear and the Lynx came along. I mean, were you ever kind of tempted by them, or were you, did you stick with the Game Boy? Yeah, so I have two brothers, one older, one younger. My parents, being the fair parents that they were, uh, got my older brother a Game Gear and my younger brother an Atari Lynx. So I got to dabble with those here and there. But still, the games were always better on the Game Boy. Yeah, and the battery life was a lot better. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> so how did you get code working on the Game Boy from, like, a PC? How did you get it over? And what do you remember when you first actually got code running on the Game Boy? Yeah, so first, you, know, you started with the, the very basic emulators that were out there i believe the first emulators were like no cash game boy um which was really cool because it had like a built-in disassembler and sprite and map viewers you could actually see what's happening in the code uh but to get actually on a game boy there was uh flash cuts back in the day um there was a company called bung and then Lixang. Uh, they were selling flash cuts you could use for development 
Well, how did you end up getting um, work on the Game Boy then, actual, like, paid work and, uh, you know, a commission, I suppose? The stuff I was making was a few demos first, just to learn the language, and the first game I put together was a conversion of the old Ultimate Rare um, classic Jetpack. I made a Game Boy version of, called Jetpack DX. Uh, we entered that into a Bung coding competition. I managed to come second place at that, and a, comp- a small company called Graphic State managed to spot that and then offered me a job. Uh, I was at university at the time, so I decided, hey, someone just offered me a job making video games. I'm going to quit university because that's why I'm here at university, to m- learn to make video games. But someone's offered me a job, so I'm going to quit university and make video games. Probably not the best idea, but is the path I took. Um, but yeah, to be professionally making games, it was, I guess, a dream come true for a kid like me. Well, you were working on a Revolt, which was a quite a big like racing title. Um, how did you work on converting that to such a small kind of system? Yeah, so I remember when he uh, offered me the job, he asked me to knock up a, a very simple racing game. So uh, I made a little car race around a simple track, and that was sort of like the proof of concept. Um, because obviously he had been vying, he, I guess he had been offered the, the conversion job for Revolt. Uh, we started with just, I guess it was, he started making some mock-ups of some cars and some tracks and we put them together and we just, you just laid in element by element, so, you know, first the cars racing around, then the other cars, the AI for the other cars and then the weapons and yeah, it went from there. But unfortunately at some point the, um, project got pulled cause I guess either it was out of budget or, um, was taking too long. Um, well, console was this for though was it the game boy color or the game boy advanced or the original game boy so this was game boy color so between uh roughly in the 2000s so the, the game boy itself was end of life uh the game boy color was the, the thing to be using at the time the game boy advance hadn't quite been announced yet so the game color gave you a little bit extra boost it, the cpu in the game of color is actually twice the speed of a game regular game boy also uh, all the color options um get, means your games had a little more uh visual fidelity um but coding wise they're very very similar uh, you also worked on a equestriad 2001 as well <laughs> uh, was that kind of a horse racing <laughs> one yeah I, I, so i believe at the time um in the uk and the olympics uh we had a lady called mary king she did really well uh, in olympics and so there were a few equestrian equestrian games that came out um and somehow we got the license for the game boy version Again, I had not, I had never done anything with horse riding before, but um, we gave it a good go. Uh, and unfortunately, that, again, that's another project that got cancelled. That must have been pretty heartbreaking, though, when you put all that time and effort into them and then they didn't get released. Yeah, indeed. I, I believe that's quite common back in the day uh, for game for uh, projects to be cancelled, either again out because of budget or time restraints. Um, we tried as best as we can to make a horse riding game, uh, but yeah, it's quite heartbreaking to see your projects never see the light of day. Well, you eventually found out that um, Revolt had been turned into ATV Racing by Rocket Games and Dattel. How did you find out about that? Did you just, like, try a demo one day and go, hey, I made this? (laughs) Yeah, so that's a really obscure, uh, really surreal thing that happened. Um, Because I remember when Revolt got canned, uh, we decided we'd take the engine we made and uh, went with um, ATV racing cars, um, racing, sorry, racing bikes. Um, my boss made a bunch of new graphics uh, and we threw them up. And uh, I remember he was going to go ship around different um, distributors and see if we could get that released. Um, I left the company before that ever happened. And I remember in the last few years, um, someone put up a Game Boy cartridge on one of the sites showing ATV racing. I'm like, I'm sure we were making a game called, called ATV racing. So I looked into it a bit more. And then after seeing screenshots of the game, it was 100%, 100% the game I was making. Uh, I managed to hunt down a cartridge myself, bought the cartridge, plugged it in, and there was the game I was working on all those years. It was really surreal. The game that you assumed had just been left to rot on a hard disk and never got released. Exactly that, yeah. yeah. So it was, it was released by, again, by Detail uh, on their unlicensed uh, Game Boy games. <laughs> well... What was the world of unlicensed Game Boy games like then? Kind of breaking free of Nintendo's restraints, I guess. Yeah, so there's a bunch of games out there, including, I, I believe, there's a, 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 the Bible series and a bunch of other games, that, which uh, before every Game Boy cartridge had to have Game Boy, uh, Nintendo's license to have the 
uh, check some code put into it. So when it boots up, the game goes deling, and it checks the Game Boy code uh, matches, so it could run. So without that, Game Game Boy games couldn't be run. But Daytel and other companies managed to circumnavigate that, and then they could make their own cartridges without the overhead from Nintendo. Because I, I have seen quite a few copies of fake Game Boy games as well, and they do have some of the Nintendo logos on the back and stuff. And it, 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 it seems similar to the uh, originals, but there's something a bit off with them. You know? Yeah, so far as I'm aware with the fake ones, they're using the original ROMs, so they still have Nintendo license code in them. Um, but there was a whole bunch of games that, 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 that didn't even touch that license code, so they were unlicensed, but they were working on real, real hardware. Yeah, I do remember reading, you know, a while back that apparently a lot of the unlicensed games didn't have any Nintendo branding anywhere because it's actually more of an offence to copy their logo and stuff than it is to actually run the games unlicensed. Indeed. Yeah. So how did they get the unlicensed titles out there then? Was it just distributed in the shops and did Nintendo ever have any, like, back- backlash? Well, uh, if you remember, Daytel were quite big with the extra replays and things like that. Yeah. And, um... Uh, they tell amongst other companies were doing these uh, releases. You could buy them in shops and online. Um, there was a Game Boy magazine back in the day called GBX, and if I remember correctly, they distributed a bunch of Daytel games on their front cover, so you could actually buy the magazine and get a free Game Boy game. And uh, you also worked on Lego Stunt Car Races as well. Was was that a, a slog? Uh, so yeah, so that was the main project we got after all these. Uh, cancelled games we worked on lego stunt rally uh, the game Boy version that i believe it was also on playstation and pc uh that was a tough project um again i, I was 19 20 years old when i was working on that i didn't really know what i was doing and the project was got bigger and bigger we had to make a lego game where you could build the track you could race the cars on the track um and this was technically i guess my first what was going to be my first uh released game and i was just not prepared for it before that, I had booked on really small mini games, I guess, games within my scope. Um, but this game was a much bigger project, and uh, without uh, any guidance, you make working on bigger projects, you, you don't really understand how to deal with bigger projects and, and scope of things. Uh, it just made it more and more difficult. So, what was the point that you decided you want to? strive alone and kind of become an indie developer and uh, was that decision scary at all so but what basically happens when i was working on lego stunt rally um i unfortunately i burned out as a kid i didn't know what i was doing i was under a lot of stress uh, with deadlines and things and at some point my brain just gave up on me and my boss had to let me go because of that so i spent a good eight years or so not being anything to do with computers and, and games and stuff i actually was a break dancer for eight years or amongst other things quite different then yeah, it's a little bit. Um, but once I got back into tech, um, I got hold of a, a little smartphone. Uh, Windows, Windows CE smartphone uh, called a T-Mobile Vario 2, I believe, and it allowed me to program on that device. I kind of got back into programming through that. So just been on the go. And again, portable devices. I'm a big fan of portable devices. Um, I got back into programming, and I started uh, Asobi Tech, which is my company, and um, we started making games again. And... It's been a good 10 years of relearning everything and getting back into programming and, and making games. It's eight years in the technology industry is like a lifetime, isn't it? It's a long time. I mean, did you find it had changed much in like almost a decade? Well, exactly that, yeah. So everything had changed. Um, things have went 3D, obviously. Uh, the mobile market had changed, and that was in 2007 when I got back into pro coding. So from 2007 to now, uh, I've spent the last 10, 11 years uh, relearning, catching up, um, trying, trying to just keep up with the changes. You know, obviously Apple, then um, Google released their phones and their ecosystems. So things change very, very rapidly. And if you don't keep up with it, you get left behind. So who is in Asobitech? Is it just you or are there other members? So predominantly it is just me. Um, it's me and the other half, I guess it's my brother. My brother obviously works on all the graphics and stuff. And uh, for audio, we call in the, 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 the talents of our friends to help wherever we can. But predominantly, it's just me. And were you a fan of the Power Glove? The Power Glove? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm sure we all watched uh, the movie The Wizard uh, and watched the Power Glove. You know how it's so, so bad, bad, it's good. <laughs> um, but I never actually owned one when I was a kid. But it was one of those things that you thought you wanted because of the movie. 
Did you ever use one of those uh, U forces as well? You know, uh, the the kind of thing where you put your hand over it and moved. Oh, in they the were weird. Different boxes. <laughs> yeah. So I was aware of the U force, but I never actually saw one in real life. Well, the reason we bring it up is because, you know, like we said at the start, we actually met a Play Expo um, in Blackpool when you were showing off uh, your new game, Mau Mau Castle. And that, I mean, uh, is it heavily inspired by Space Harrier? Yeah, um, Mau Mau Castle is definitely a love letter to um, Space Harrier. Uh, one of my favourite games, for sure. What memories have you got of Space Harrier when you were young then? Uh, I remember going down to the, the arcades in, 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 in Brighton and Margate and South End and seeing the wonderful arcade machines there and Space Harrier being one of them. And it was just so bright and vibrant and so uh, nothing else had close to it. And then I remember getting it on my Atari ST and um, in my mind it was a, a one-to-one conversion. Obviously, and I'm now older and I see it's not exactly a perfect conversion, but at that age, it was good enough, and um, I fell in love with the game, for sure. So, um, this controller that you use for it, it's actually accurate. Like, I, I've seen all these U-Force and Power Glove stuff and everything, and <laughs> they don't really work that well. But this controller that you have is massively accurate. What is it? Yeah, so for Mau Mau Castle, when we show it at events, we show it with a, a leap motion controller. Uh, this controller has been developed and been around for a while. It's got two cameras in there, and a couple of LED lights, kind of like a mini Microsoft Connect, I guess, in that respect, and it tracks your hands very, very well, like a, a one-to-one uh, tracking. Um, it's now used a lot in VR. Uh, if you go to any big VR installations, the mount these units in front on top of the, the head units so you can see your hands in VR, um, and they're incredible. They, they work really well. So tell us a bit about the game then. What's kind of the, the storyline there, and what, where did the idea and the concept come from? Sure. So Mama Castle was originally um, made for a game jam. Uh, we made it for something called Castle Game Jam. That was two years ago. We were in a castle in Sweden. Um, there was about 300 developers, and the, the theme was dimensions. So we came out with this game from another dimension uh, of a flying cat dragon who collects rainbows. Um, I, at the time, was uh, discussing it with my brother about the old art styles, um, and the old Super uh, Sega Super Scaler games, so uh, Afterburner, Outrun, Super Hang On, and of course Space Harrier. And I, I said I'd re- really like, like to recreate that art style and, and that effect uh, in one of our next games. And uh, so that's how where the idea came for that. We took the bonus stages from Space Harrier, where you ride the back of the dragon Uriah and smash through things. Uh, we took influences from Studio Ghibli, uh, Never Ending Story and many other things, and we put them together and came together with this crazy idea for Mau Mau Castle, the flying cat dragon. And the, and the crazy thing is, it's, it's old school, and it's using weird <laughs> motion controls, but it seems so relevant because of stuff like Nyan Cat and the whole meme <laughs> culture at yeah. the moment. So, yeah, indeed, yeah, we took, again, we took influences from wherever we could. For, obviously, cats are big, huge on the internet. Um, uh, everybody loves cats, it seems. And um, but we wanted to stay true to the old school, so we took the resolution of 320 degree, uh, 320 pixels by 200 pixels. Um, so it's big, chunky, fat pixels with the scaling going on. Um, but we took stuff we knew from the old, but we took a, a modern level structure. So the game is played in, in sh- really short bursts, really short waves, um, and it's quick free starts. And we took everything from that, so everything from the old and from the new. We mushed them together, and we get this crazy game called Mau Mau Castle. And I love playing it as well. I mean, you probably remember I was terrible at it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think I lasted about a minute and a half. But, uh, the more you play it, it's one of these, you know, you, you just got to learn the game, I guess. It's, you know, the more you play it, the better you get. Indeed. Um, again, it's, it's taken from the old arcade culture. Uh, it's very much our arcade game in, in the sense that you learn the levels and the more you learn, the better you, you get. It's a very quick reaction game as well. So um, once you know what's coming in the levels, you, you're ready to react to what's coming towards you. Um, there's a, a good level, a good amount of randomization in the game. So even though you may know what's coming, you don't know exactly where it's coming. And I think I got distracted by the, the chip music in it. It's so good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. So the tune in it is amazing. I, I love the tune in it. It's done by a friend of ours called Kane McCormack. Uh, I believe he worked on uh, audio for Alien Isolation back in the day. We met at an event and then he was really int- we got talking about chip tunes and he was really excited to do the music for Mau Mau Castle. Um, but yeah, I've, it's been two years and I still love the tune. 
It's really odd as well because at the moment the technology like with VR and stuff, all these beat games and kind of uh, motion games and stuff are really being accepted by people when years ago they would have just been scared off <laughs> thinking it's not going to work, you know. Yeah, it's amazing to see uh, how uh, how far music games come. Cause I remember playing Vib Ribbon on PlayStation, and yeah. uh, no, no one really understood it. But then you then you got Guitar Hero, uh, Rock Band, uh, and now obviously Beat Saber in VR is incredible. Yeah, I was playing Beat Saber last night. I was just like, that's amazing. Yeah, and this this game actually really fits in with that, even though it's all old school pixely and everything. It's great. <laughs> Yeah, it's got the very, that very that rhythmic feel to it. You, you kind of find your zone and find your rhythm, and, and then you just fly through all the waves um, in a very almost musical fashion. Well, why did you decide to make Mamo Castle like motion control then instead of like a traditional just like, you know, D-pad or an analog controller? What was it about that different input that interested you? So Mamo Castle is actually a mobile game. Uh, we designed it primarily to be played on a mobile device with a touchscreen. Um but when we decided to make this as a, a full game, because we managed to win uh, best game, best music, best graphics at Castle Game Jam, um, and everyone's like, "Oh, this is great! You should make this a real game." We said, "Cool, we should do that." And uh, we started showing it at events on the mobile devices on the tablet, but we couldn't get much attention uh, as people walk past. It's very hard to grab people's attention with a tablet on a display. So we decided, "How do we make this more accessible? How do we make this more of a spectacle?" So we got a large projector screen, and we got the, the motion sensor, and now this is our arcade version, as it were. So you'd go to the arcade, you play the big bombastic version, and then you go home and play the home versions on your mobile device. Is there any way for anyone to actually play the, like the arcade version at home then? Can you get that hardware, or is it quite specialised? Well, yeah, the Leap Motion has been, like I said, has been around for about five or six years or so, um, and people are using it in VR. So if anyone actually has a Leap Motion out there, feel free, uh, tell them to feel free to just message me on Twitter or something like that, and I'll happily send them that version. Well, you've been uh, all over the world kind of promoting this, and uh, wh- where's the best place that Mau Mau Castle's taken you so far? Um, I think my favorite place has been Gamescom. We, we did Gamescom last year. Uh, we got in in the retro area and uh, Rene who runs the retro area has put a, a great display of retro things and I'm a huge retro fan obviously and um, to have Mammal Castle in front of all those retro fans at Gamescom it was incredible it's a huge event isn't it it's absolutely massive huge yeah, indeed it's, it's probably second only to E3 in terms of uh, size uh, they have like 10 halls of, of gaming content um, but obviously we were in the retro area and, and retro is where my heart is. Well, talking about retro is where your heart is. I've seen you appearing on a uh, YouTuber's uh, channels and stuff with some strange consoles recently. So how big is your collection? So yeah, I've been collecting quite a while now. Um, uh, I unfortunately fell into the, I guess the trap or is it a trap? I don't know. Um, in, in, into the thing of I need to collect them box to complete, uh, which is makes it very, very difficult. But because I've been doing this for quite a few years now, uh, we're now at roughly 230-odd consoles. Wow. And and you're you're getting these at shows then? How, how are you sourcing these uh, items? So back in the early days, it was literally just eBay and, 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 and car boot sales and things like that. But over time, I found out about Facebook groups. Uh, there's a really strong uh, retro uh, trading scene going on on Facebook. And then someone introduced me to a Yahoo Japanese auctions. And then it opened the whole new Japanese market to me. And uh, I've been importing like crazy from Japan. What are the prices like from Japan then? Are they cheaper than over here? Or? Theoretically, yes. Um, with commission and import, tax and delivery it can get very expensive also when you're importing crts yes. so like things like the super famcom tv monitor and the dreamcast monitors they get very expensive but opening the japanese markets up ups means it's easier to find stuff that you couldn't find over here normally all right kwang you can make us jealous now then um tell us some of the coolest stuff in your collection then which one is you most proud of um so i was really lucky to get hold of the dreamcast tv the divers 2000 cx1 oh yeah um that's a beautiful machine it, it's really obscure in the way it looks and, and uh, how hard it is to get hold of one i believe Please, someone's told on me that. That there's, <laughs> apparently i was told there's maybe only 2000 out there um i don't know how true that is but um, it's a possibility. Um, also, I guess um, the Super Famicom TVs are really nice. Uh, these are com- combination TVs with, uh, from Sharp, and they have Super Famicoms built into them. 
Um, one of the big holy grails I have is an Entex Adventure Vision. Uh, there's been videos about that. Even the Sharp uh, Famicom Titler, which is like a Genlock machine where you can add stuff to video inputs and it plays Famicom games as well. I, I never knew that, that existed. <laughs> Yeah, there's a whole bunch of weird ones. Um, even simple stuff like that. Uh, I say simple, but people I know people don't have them, like the Panasonic Q, which is a GameCube made by Panasonic. Uh, it's very 90s styled with blue LEDs, and uh, it takes a full-size CD uh, disc so you can play DVDs on it. I know a lot of people were upset when the GameCube couldn't play DVDs, but if you've got a Panasonic Q, you could. Well, I know you're also a big fan of handhelds, so uh, you've got a lot of them in your collection as well, I guess. Yeah, so handhelds are, are again, my, my, my biggest love, I guess, for consoles. Uh, with, with the Game Boy Color still being my favorite console ever, uh, for sure. Um, there are a lot more handhelds than you think they are. Uh, I recently did an unboxing video where I unboxed all my handhelds except for Nintendo ones, and it came in at over 50 handhelds that aren't even Nintendos. Well, you know when you get like a new system, um, what do you kind of give it any checks first? I mean, do you do the recapping thing and the restoration? What do you kind of look out for when you get a new system to make sure it's working? Yeah, usually we just um, obviously wax some batteries in, boot up, see if it works. Uh, there are a number that are obviously well known for having bad capacitors, so the Game Gear, the uh, Turbo Express, um, those definitely have bad capacitors. Um, so I'm lucky in that my cousin does uh, hardware repair. I take it to see him, and he fixes them up for me. Um, but yeah, just make sure they're working. Uh, make sure again they, they have their box uh, and all, all the bits. That, it's always upsetting when you buy something that's uh, checked as boxed, but it only has the outer box. Uh, it's the internal packaging that gets missing, uh, goes missing quite a bit. And I've now got into the habit of when I'm buying something to ask first, does it have the internal packaging as well as the outer packaging? So do you have a, a room in your house that's just completely full of consoles or are they spread around or in storage or something like that no so that, yeah um i i have a, a double-sized room downstairs that has all the consoles and unfortunately all in crates uh, i haven't had time to unpack them all and, and show them on display um but I, the crates are like 184 liter crates and there's about 24 of them all full of consoles so it, it's quite a lot it must be if, you, if you've got a system like right at the back and all those crates and you want to set it up one day, you've got to kind of pull everything out then, have you? Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> whenever someone comes over and wants to see a certain console, it does take a little while for me to pull them out and find the right ones and then plug them all in. And it's a bit of a hassle at the moment. Oh, I'm feeling your pain. I've got to find the cables. I'm the same. And I think one day I just need like a mansion or something just full of like consoles. Yeah, I was watching these, um, like room videos from people in America or in Australia and they have huge pieces of land and huge houses that fit all this stuff in. I unfortunately live in London, and London's space is a premium, so it's a bit more difficult here. Yeah. yeah, I think you'd have to sell your collection to afford a house that size in London. Or, or <laughs> Airbnb it to a geek. <laughs> <laughs> it's good yeah, yeah, one of the yeah, an Airbnb it and people are like, hey, do you want to stay in a room full of consoles? <laughs> <laughs> So what events are you going to be at this year as well, uh, promoting Mau Mau Castle? Oh, so um, I think the next event we'll be at is probably going to be Play Expo London. I'm very excited for that. Uh, Play Expo comes to London. Oh, yeah, uh, looking forward to that. I've, I've been to many other ones. I've been to Play Expo Glasgow, Blackpool, Manchester, or Leeds, all the other ones. Um, it was nice to have one in our hometown. And uh, are there any future games planned at, uh, at Sobe Tech or...? Yeah, so we actually were working on a game before Mau Mau Castle had, had taken over. We were doing a platformer uh, for Dr. Harrison and the Blood Crystals. Unfortunately, we, we tried to make both games at the same time, but uh, obviously uh, I, I did this in, actually doing this in my spare time, so making one game is hard enough in my spare time, let alone making two. Um, so that we put that on hold. Uh, once Mau Mau's done, we'll look at probably revisiting that, but uh, I've watched the market change so rapidly that it may not be a good fit. So we have, I think, about 10 prototypes sitting there waiting to be made. Uh, we just need to decide which is the best one at the time. I love the fact that you're keeping it retro and keeping it real as well. I think, you know, that, that's got to get a lot of love from people. And, you know, as soon as I saw that game and I was taken back to being like, you know, 10 years old and seeing Space Harrier for the first time, it, it was very cool. Yeah, every time people watch, uh, see the game, they walk past and, and you can tell, tell what age they are because the older people or our age will go, hey, that's Space Harrier. Yeah. And then you explain it's not obviously not Space Harrier, it's a homage to Space Harrier. Uh, the slightly younger kids will say, oh, look, it's Star Fox. 
Um, apparently, the, the green and the three D effect reminds them of Star Fox, and even the younger kids, younger than that, will say, "Hey, it's um, it's Nine Cat." So, <laughs> yeah. it's a sign of a great game that it can cross generations as well. Oh yeah, for sure. We've made very sure that the game play uh, is uh, accept, uh, is open to everyone of all ages and all 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 types. Um, I think the oldest lady we had playing was she was seventy six or so. She came playing it and she loved it to pieces. And we have the kids, the youngest three years old, love it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's good good board board uh, range of appeal. Well, Quang, I'll be looking out for you at Play Expo in London and trying to uh, beat my record of about 20 seconds on uh, <laughs> that castle. Thank you so much for coming on. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Oh, it's been great. Thanks for having us. And if people want to find out more, have you got a website people can check out? Yeah, you can check us out um, on Asobi Tech, uh, Asobi.tech, that's A-S-O-B-I dot tech, E-C-H. Or we're on Twitter as well, Facebooks and the Instagrams and all the other good stuff. Excellent. Good. We'll see you soon. See you then.